Hello there. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Ken Chea. I'm the president of the Linnaean Society of New York, and I'd like to call this meeting to order. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, I knew that you, I, I know you could be doing other things like having dinner or foraging on social media or looking for a snowy owl somewhere, or you could be watching uh, a James Bond film on Hulu or Netflix, uh, maybe GoldenEye or one of my favorites, Casino Royale, or maybe one of the classics, Dr. No or Goldfinger. But instead you're here tonight with us which demonstrates and confirms to me, not only the importance of nature in our world, but also the importance of a naturalist community. So thank you for joining us and being part of the society's meeting and the, this Linnaean online community. Speaking of 007 films, I wonder how many of you really know about the real James Bond. When you hear the name Bond, how many of you actually think of a book on birds of the West Indies. Well, we're gonna to get to the bottom of this conundrum tonight with the help of this month's speakers in a program that I think you are going to find very interesting. So sit back and prepare to be shaken, not stirred. According to my participants list, let me check it right now, 246 people are watching. That's excellent. So once again, a very warm welcome to everyone for joining us tonight. Right now, I'd like to give a meaningful shout out to my team of fellow officers, council and committee members whose time and effort continue to keep the society moving forward. It's coming up on one year now that I've been working with this talented and devoted group of volunteers. Without their hard work and support, we would not be streaming live right now or welcoming new members each month or reaching you through social media and our website or sponsoring Linnaean field trips. They are a fantastic group and I'm honored to work alongside of them. Since we are coming to the end of our term, I'd like to now recognize them by name, if I may. Uh, Vice President Rochelle Thomas, Secretary Lydia Thomas, Recording Secretary Amy Simmons, Treasurer Ruth Hart, Editor Jonathan Hyman, and Council Members Marie Claire Cunningham, Kathleen Matthews, Ursula Mitra, Sherry Felix, Mary Jane Kaplan, Bruce Yolton, and Mary Beth Cooper, and Vicki Seabrook, and Gabriel Willow. And last but not least turns our committee members and chairs, Stephen Chang of the Awards Committee, Chuck McAlexander, who keeps us playing by the rules of our constitution, Jonathan Hyman, editorial chair, our hardworking field trip committee members, Miriam Rakowski, Mary Beth Cooper, Deborah Mullins, Anne Lazarus, Vicki Seabrook and Marie Claire Cunningham. They, they're doing a fantastic job for us uh, and, and have been for some time and they, they really need uh, to know how much appreciation and what a big part they play in the success of the society. So thank you ladies very much. Uh, moving on, Gabriel Willow for his, fi his field observations, excuse me. Uh, Kathleen Matthews for membership and a special shout out here to Kathleen and volunteer Erica Pick for their valuable work in posting LSNY announcements to social media. Thank you both. Rochelle Thomas for lining up speaker programs like this one. Bruce Yolton who keeps our dynamic and developing website up and running and fresh. And finally, Tom Burke for his devoted and continuing management of the rare bird alert. My sincere thanks to one and all. So tonight marks our sixth speaker meeting taking place live and online. Still, we have no further news from the American Museum of Natural History as to when we may expect to return to the Linder Theater. 
We will continue to bring our, you our future meetings online delivered to the safety and comfort of your home right here on Zoom. For tonight's program, we've disabled the Zoom chat feature as well as video and microphone. Zoom's Q&A feature, however, is fully functional. And during tonight's program, you may use that feature at the bottom of your screen to send us any questions that you may have for tonight's speakers. Following the presentation, our Vice President Rochelle Thomas will take time to select a few of your questions. I have three business items to announce this evening. Two are the recent vote, voting results from January. And thank you, by the way, to all members for returning your votes. And the third is an important announcement about our upcoming annual meeting. With 103 votes of approval and zero votes of opposition, motion number one, it gives me great pleasure to welcome the following nine applicants as new members to the Linnaean Society of New York. Judith R. Gordon, sponsored by Lee Kuba. Cynthia Roberts, sponsored by Ken Chea. Susan Steinbrock, sponsored by Ken Chea. Richard Davis, sponsored by Kevin Sisko. Michelle Talek, sponsored by Crystal Thiel. Leslie Day, sponsored by Ken Chea. Sh uh, Shri, uh, Shira, excuse me, Shri Yas Gupta, sponsored by Miriam Rakowski. Diane McKeever, sponsored by Miriam Rakowski and Erica Rooney, sponsored by Dolores Brendan Thompson. So Judith, Cynthia, Susan, Richard, Michelle, Leslie, Shriyas, Diana, and Erica, if any of you are out there right now, imagine if you will, the applause being generated by all the members of the society. It's coming through, streaming through hundreds of computers and bouncing around in your living room right now. Congratulations to all and welcome to the Linnaean Society of New York. And by the way, I bet there's someone out there right now who is wondering about becoming a Linnaean Society member. I, I could feel it. I know you're out there. Well, listen, it's really easy. And we would love to hear from you. Just go to our website, LinnaeanNewYork.org, and you will find all the information that you need. Now, in case you need a sponsor, and you don't know that many Linnaean members yet? No worries. Our sponsorship requirement is really more of a formality and it's less daunting than it may seem. In fact, you may contact me and I'll be happy to be your sponsor. In addition, you may contact any other officers of the society about sponsorship, the vice president, treasurer, secretary, uh, editor, all of their email addresses, can be found with mine at the bottom of the website's homepage under contacts. So you see, you're not just stuck with me, you have choices here. Just scroll down to the bottom of the screen on the homepage, click contacts. There you will find all the names and addresses of the officers that I just mentioned. You may contact any one of us about sponsorship or for more information. And please remember, any society or organization is only as healthy as its growing and diverse membership. We welcome all to become members of the Linnaean Society of New York, regardless of race, religion, gender identity, sexual orientation, age, background, geographic location, or even the number of bird species you have on your life list. We promise we won't ask you about that. We would love to hear from you and welcome you to our community of birders and nature lovers. I have got more good news. In addition to motion one, motion two to accept the January general meeting minutes also passed by a vote of 104 to zero. Voting is a very important part of what we do as members. So again, thank you everyone for sending your votes in via email. As a reminder, I would also like to add that although we have been meeting on Zoom uh, only since September, 
This is still an official meeting of the Linnaean Society. And as such, it is a forum for topics of interest to our membership. If you have a topic or an announcement under the item of new business that you would like to propose, you may send me or the secretary a note by email. And finally, before we begin tonight's program, I'd like to mention that next month at our annual business meeting, excuse me, it's our annual, it, we used to call it a dinner meeting. Remember we used to meet for dinner before COVID? Uh, now it's an annual meeting and it's taking place Tuesday, March 9th. We will be presenting a slate of officers to be voted on by the membership. Voting will be handled electronically just as we've been doing for the past six months. All members will receive an email from me immediately following that meeting asking to return your votes on the officers within 24 hours. If there are any nominations from the floor, the names of the candidates must be submitted to our secretary, Lydia Thomas, no later than midnight, February 23rd. The secretary may be contacted via email at secretary at linnaeannewyork.org or by U.S. mail addressed to our P.O. box, which is the Linnaean Society of New York, Post Office Box 801, New York, New York, 10024. Both of those addresses, the postal address and the email address for the secretary can be found on our website under contacts. Be sure to include the name and email of any candidates and the office position that you are nominating them for. Each nomination from the floor, and this is important, must be accompanied by 15 member signatures, which can be submitted electronically by including the name and the email address of each signing member. This live online meeting will only be open to Linnaean Society members. The evening's presentation by Peter and Rosemary Grant on their study of Darwin's finches and the Galapagos Islands will be recorded and will be made available for public viewing on our website at a later date. Now, all of the information I just gave you about the annual meeting has been recently emailed to all members of the society in my February president's letter. Another invitation to the annual meeting will be forthcoming to all LSNY members in another week or two. So be on the lookout for that. And now for tonight's feature presentation, Jim Wright is the author of The Real James Bond, the story of the ornithologist author who was the victim of the greatest identity theft in history. Although Bond, who wrote the landmark book, Birds of the West Indies in 1936, is now mostly a footnote for 007 fans, he lived a life of great accomplishment. Tonight, Jim will give an illustrated talk about Bond's life and career with special mention of ornithologists who were also spies. And we'll talk about three Bond specimens in the American Museum of Natural History collection, the St. Lucia black finch, La Self thrush, and the Bahama nuthatch, uh, nuthatch, excuse me, that is now feared to be extinct. Jim Wright has written large format books about the New Jersey Meadowlands, Hawk Mountain, and Central America's Selva Maya. He is the longtime birding columnist for the record in northern New Jersey. Following Jim's presentation, he will be joined by ornithologist Dr. Joseph Wonderly, who is the editor of the Journal of Caribbean Ornithology, to discuss bond and current conservation efforts in the Caribbean. Now, please join me in welcoming Jim Wright. Hi, everybody. I'm Jim Wright, and I'd just like to thank the Linnaean Society for having me give this talk tonight. I regret 
that it is by Zoom and not in person, but I think we're able to reach a few more people uh, this way. And uh, I think the weather is probably better sitting at home than being out in the Northeast with the snow we've had. Uh, I also like to thank uh, Rochelle Thomas and Ruth and Bruce uh, for uh, all the work behind the scenes here. So I'm gonna share my screen and we'll get going with the show. Okay, I think we should be going here. So I'm gonna be talking about James Bond, Rare Birds and a Spy or Two with Joe Wonderly uh, is gonna talk about the Caribbean birds uh, when I'm done. And I thought I'd start with this uh, uh, really cool uh, program I found last week in which the real James Bond spoke to the Linnaean Society on April 11th, 1944. So I feel like I'm in very good footsteps. Uh, a little about me, Ken mentioned some stuff. I'd also like to mention uh, that I am from Philadelphia, like the real James Bond. Uh, like James Bond, my name is James, but I go by Jim. Uh, I'm part Scottish, I'm six foot two, I like birds, and my middle name even begins with a B. So I guess I was destined to write this book. Uh, about the book and the dust jacket especially, uh, I was thrilled when I saw what the cover was going to be. That is uh, the bird man in the lower right. And if you're uh, a bird buff, you may recognize the head as that of a Cuban green woodpecker. Uh, the cover is designed by Molly Shields. I thought she did a great job. Uh, real 007 buffs may be aware this is not the first time that James Bond posed as a bird. So I'm going to show a little clip here of Goldfinger uh, and give you a taste of the kind of the crazy 007 phenomenon that was going on in the 1960s. So here goes. You have to watch very closely here. I think that's where the term gullible comes from. Uh, a little about the book. It is uh, very richly, lavishly illustrated with more than 100 illustrations, uh, some never seen before, and many of them pretty rare. That is a Cuban toady up on the right. On the upper left is a postage stamp featuring the ornithologist James Bond. Uh, the book also features a uh, a little uh, parody of James Bond called Goldfincher. And I uh, love the illustration. I was able to get to go with it. Uh, so I wrote the book to try to find the intersection between pop culture and birding so we could get more people who are interested in 007 interested in birds as well. Uh, I also came across this great quote from Julie Zikafus, who is an ornithologist and an author, and she wrote, if the real James Bond is nothing more than uh, get people to realize an ornithologist can be something other than proper, stodgy, or dull, he will have done a great service. Uh, the irony of all this is that the real James Bond <laughs> was uh, sort of the stereotypical uh, ornithologist. Uh, he smoked a pipe, wore glasses, wore a bow tie, seen here holding a couple of dead birds. Uh, he kind of looked, reminded me of Wally Cox, uh, who was in the Bird Watchers episode of uh, the Beverly Hillbillies, uh, of course, with Miss, Miss Jane Hathaway. Uh, 
real James Bond, who lived from 1900 to 1989, was actually a quite handsome guy. His wife insisted that he was better looking than Sean Connery. Uh, growing up Bond in Philadelphia was uh, quite a trip. Uh, his family was extremely rich. Uh, the picture on the left is Bond with his older brother Francis and his mother Margaret, who was a Roebling of the Brooklyn Bridge Building Roeblings. The picture on the right is of Francis Bond. He was a founding partner of E.B. Smith and Company, which later became Smith Barney, which made money the old fashioned way. Uh, the Bonds were not without tragedy. Uh, Bond's older sister, Margaret, uh, died of a ruptured appendix in Maine. Uh, when Bond was four, she was seven. It was big news in Philadelphia because Francis Bond actually uh, took a special train and chartered a boat to get to Maine in time to see her before she died. Uh, this was a, a tragedy that affected the Bonds for years. Uh, they moved out of their center city townhouse and built a house uh, out in the sticks north of Philadelphia. Uh, the estate, 320 acres, was called Willowbrook. And you're looking at the Bonds uh, mansion. Uh, these days, Willowbrook is the uh, campus of Gwynedd Mercy University. And the building there you see is the administration building. Uh, shortly after uh, they moved into Willowbrook, Bond's mother died and uh, another family tragedy. His father uh, married a widow from London within the year and moved uh, the two Bond boys to London. Uh, Jim Bond went to Harrow. Uh, wasn't a happy time for him. He was teased for being American and uh, his accent and a lot of cowboys and Indian jokes. Uh, I discovered his name is still carved into one of the walls at Harrow. After high school, after Harrow, he went to Trinity College in, Ox in Cambridge, excuse me, and uh, Turns out that Jim Bond, the American ornithologist, spent his teenage years in Great Britain. Uh, after school, when he graduated, he became a banker in Philadelphia and uh, soon realized that he hated it. What he really wanted to do was to study birds. He came into a small inheritance and realized that if he really scrimped and pinched his pennies, he could live off his inheritance. So he quit his job and took a job with the Academy of Natural Sciences and an ornithologist at no pay whatsoever. Uh, the good news was when the depression hit, they didn't fire him because he wasn't getting paid anything. Uh, that's Jim Bond on the right, of course. Uh, Bond decided to make his life's work the West Indies. And as you can see, that is a lot of water and a lot of islands. To get there, since he was uh, operating on a shoestring, Bond traveled by mail boat typically. And uh, one of the big problems was that he got seasick for the first two or three days when he was out to sea. So this was quite a challenge. When he got to the Caribbean, uh, he traveled on foot or on horseback and uh, he stayed in the local huts and uh, slept in a hammock, typically. Uh, this is a shot of a charcoal burner hut in the Zapata Swamp in Cuba. And uh, Bond spent a couple months here, I believe, uh, in 1934, documenting the Zapata rail and the other now famous Zapata birds. Uh, he lived by eating the local rodents, by the way. Some of the tools of Bond's trade. Uh, my favorite is uh, the pocket knife on the upper left there. This is Bond's pocket knife from the archives of the Academy of Natural Sciences. And yes, etched on the blade is for flesh only, which sounds like the title of a 007 novel. Uh, Bond liked arsenic a lot for uh, curing the birds, for preserving them and uh, cutting down the pests that would get in the feathers. And uh, he used a double-barreled shotgun uh, to collect the birds down there. 
Uh, so tonight I'd like to talk about three birds that Bond collected for the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, there are over 800,000 birds in the American Museum's collection. And I thought I'd just talk about three of the ones that Bond collected and donated to them. Uh, the cell thrush, when Bond visited Haiti in 1929, he set out to find the rare LaSalle thrush. At first glance, the bird resembles uh, the similar sized American robin with its brick red chest, but you can see it has that marvelous yellow gold eye ring and uh, just a more put together appearance. Uh, this is a shot of the skin that Bond collected and uh, a little description of uh, how he got the bird it required uh, spending the night and then uh, nearby taking a horseback for like 20 miles and uh, then staying in a hut and or sleeping bag got very cold and uh, it was uh, quite a challenge but he managed to get that bird for them. Uh, then there is the Bahama nuthatch. Uh, so despite Bond's seasickness, his philosophy for reaching some of the islands was by any means necessary. And that included uh, traveling by a banana boat, sloop, uh, you name it. Uh, in this case, uh, getting to get the Bahama Nuthatch, he traveled by a rum runner. He had to go to High Rock Settlement in the Bahamas, and the only vessel would take him was a bootlegger sloop at night on a deck piled high with gas cans filled with contraband liquor. Bond grabbed his duffel, his hammock, and shotgun and bummed a ride. When he got to Grand Rock, High Rock Settlement, one of the local islanders was kind enough to let him stay in his hut, and Bond collected birds for the next five mornings. The trip turned out to be a major success. Bond collected two specimens of the previously undescribed Bahama nuthatch. The bird is close relative of the brown-headed nuthatch of the southeastern United States, and many ornithologists consider it to be a distinct species. The Bahama nuthatch is the only member of that family in the West Indies, and now, fearing uh, following two hurricanes in the past five years, it is thought to be extinct. Uh, Bond actually uh, said in his introduction to the first birds of the West Indies, that uh, hurricanes often take a heavy toll of bird life, particularly destructive on the low-lying Bahama Islands, although it is surprising that the havoc caused by these storms is not greater. Uh, sadly, the uh, havoc caused by the storms finally caught up with the Bahama nuthatch. Uh, also, I want to talk about the St. Lucia black finch, and this is the story as told by Mary Wickham Bond in one of her memoirs. The story begins in 1835 when Charles Darwin collected his black finches in the Galapagos Islands. About 50 years later, the Smithsonian sent an expedition to the Galapagos and on the way, it stopped on the island where it bought a collection of birds from a local man. Among them was a black finch strikingly similar to Darwin's black finch. When asked where he got the bird, the man waved his hand and said, up in the mountains. It was later assumed that the unusual specimen had actually been collected in the Galapagos and mislabeled. In 1927, when Jim Bond set out on his first trip to the West Indies, he stopped at the American Museum where a curator told him, hey, if you get to St. Lucia, be sure to look for the black finch. It took, it took two trips, but Bond collected several, including the first females known to science. Mary Bond writes, on his return to New York, Jim again stopped at the American Museum. James Chapin, head of the African department, was standing on a ladder working on his collection and asked Jim politely, and how was your trip? Jim couldn't resist sounding a little triumphant when he replied, I collected a genus you haven't got in the American Museum. And then he told his story. Chapin rushed off with the news to Frank Chapman, head of the bird department, who sat down and wrote to Whitmer Stone, curator of birds at the Academy of Natural Sciences, asking for one of the specimens. And here is that specimen. Uh, kind of neat to see the story behind some of these bird skins. 
Uh, so Bond is in the West Indies for a decade, and he finally comes out with his life's work, Birds of the West Indies, published by the Academy of Natural Sciences. He had tried to sell it to Lippincott and Company, but uh, Joe Lippincott told him personally, sorry, this isn't something for the museums. Uh, this is something for the museums. It's not something for a publisher. Uh, as you all know, <laughs> the, bird, the book in its various editions stayed in print for more than six decades. And uh, I bet uh, many people listening in tonight have their own copy of Birds of the West Indies. I wanted to point out the, the, the edition in the upper left corner there the, with the green cover. Uh, that sold recently at auction uh, a signed copy by James Bond sold for $5,000, including all the buyer's premiums. So some of these books have gotten quite valuable uh, in part because of the 007 connection, of course, but also because this was everyone's Bible when they went to the West Indies if they were looking for birds. Uh, so when I researched the book, I was surprised at how many of James Bond's colleagues, uh, ornithologists, were spies for the Office of Strategic Services, it's the forerunner of the CIA during World War II. And uh, my book is out as an audio book. And uh, I thought I'd have Raphael Corkill, who's the narrator, uh, discuss, describe the connection between bird watchers and spies. Chapter 008. Twitches and spooks. If Ian Fleming's choice of name for his secret agent was mere happenstance, it was also serendipitous. Ornithologists and bird watchers have been some of the most successful members of the intelligence community in modern British and American history, and some of the most notorious too. Although ornithology as a profession took root in the early 1800s, it wasn't until the 20th century that museums and universities routinely sent field scientists to far-flung corners of the globe. These researchers, especially ornithologists, became natural recruits for intelligence work during the two world wars, the Cold War, and other conflicts. In a 2015 article for The Guardian, Helen MacDonald, author of H is for Hawk, explained why birds and espionage dovetailed so nicely. Birdwatcher is old intelligence slang for spy. You have the same skills, the ability to identify, recognize, be unobtrusive, invisible, hide. You pay careful attention to your surroundings. You never feel part of the crowd. To that, I would add that ornithologists who work in foreign countries, like Jim Chapin here, uh, have an additional skill set that includes self-reliance and a familiarity with the local terrain and customs. They're outsiders, but they're not strangers, so they don't draw attention. They carry surveillance equipment like high-powered binoculars, and they know their way around firearms. I researched all seven of these gentlemen at the National Archives and turned up some uh, cool tidbits. I'm just going to talk about one of the colleagues here, Jim Chapin of the uh, American Museum, and he was one of the legends of 20th century ornithology. Uh, he made a name for himself uh, when he went to the Congo with a colleague for the American Museum. He was 19 year old Columbia University student at the time. He spent six years in the Belgian Congo, including 14 months when he and his uh, colleague were incommunicado with the outside world and feared dead. Uh, I found this article about uh, Jim Chapin and the trip and uh, I just like to read uh, an abridged version of the first paragraph to give you a sense of what he went through. 3,000 miles of weary tramping through fever haunted jungles in the miasmic heart of the Go Congo Basin. Strange encounters with savage beasts. The discovery and classification for science under enormous difficulty. The most complete collection of natural history specimens that has ever been rested 
from the mysterious depths of the dark continent. Uh, he came out with a four volume set called The Birds of the Belgian Congo in around 1936. And this is, uh, I believe, still the text for the area. Uh, just as Jim Vaughn wrote Birds of the West Indies, Chapin wrote Birds of the Belgian Congo. Uh, Chapin, at the outbreak of World War II, was recruited to be a spy back in the Belgian Congo. And uh, he joined the OSS and was soon uh, deployed there because he knew the country so well, he fit in, blended in, and also the Congo held the world supply of the richest uranium. And the Americans wanted to get the uranium out of the Belgian Congo before the Nazis got their hands on it. Uh, and they succeeded and it became the Manhattan Project. Uh, Chapin's assignment included investigating activities by enemy agents and expanding intelligence operations in Africa. After a year and a half, he returned to his job at the American Museum. And after the war, Chapin and his wife, Ruth Trimble, Chapin lived in the Eastern Congo for six more years and studied birds again. Uh, I share this story from a friend of Chapin's. I just heard it in the past month, so it's not in the book. Uh, at one point, uh, Jim Chapin and his wife were staying on the second floor of a hotel in Africa. And Jim would shoot birds with a cane gun from the window in his room. He would then change his cane gun to just a cane, hobble down to the lobby, walk out on the street, and express amazement at finding a dead bird. Back to the room and some happy time skinning the bird. Uh, just amazed me that 10 years after being in the Belgian Congo, he is back with his wife and he's still working undercover. Uh, Chapin died at his home in the Upper West Side at the age of 74 in 1964. At the time, he was curator emeritus of the museum and still engaged in bird research. While I was at the American Museum and taking pictures of those bird skins uh, with the help of ornithologist Paul Sweet, I stopped by Paul's office and I found uh, this great trunk uh, from Jim Chapin sent back to the American Museum of Natural History in New York. And I just felt his presence when I saw that and uh, just wanted to share that tonight. Uh, so seven of Jim Bond's colleagues are spies. You kind of wonder, was Jim Bond a spy? And I went to the National Archives and researched uh, all these gentlemen. There was extensive records on all of them and there was nothing about Jim Bond. But I researched his travels and I discovered that in 1941, before the outbreak of World War II, Jim Bond traveled on the SS America from New York City to the Caribbean. And he traveled on this cruise ship, which was the largest, fastest, most luxurious cruise ship in the world. And I'm going, well, Jim Bond was a cheapskate. There's no way in the world he'd be traveling on the SS America. So I looked into the SS America and did a search for uh, SS America and spies, I guess. And it turns out that two crewmen on that trip, that voyage to the West Indies were spies, members of the notorious Duquesne spy ring. And they worked as crewmen in the kitchen, uh, known as the butcher and the baker. Can't make this up. And when the voyage was over, they were arrested and eventually convicted of selling secrets to Nazi Germany. Uh, turns out that when the voyage was over, the SS America became a troop ship and in fact had been designed to be a troop ship when it was built in 1939. And uh, the members of the Duquesne spy ring passed along this information to Nazi Germany. So uh, got me to thinking, maybe Jim Bond was a spy after all. Uh, the picture behind me here, by the way, is the Bay of Pigs uh, in Cuba. And uh, James Bond was there just before uh, the Bay of Pigs invasion in uh, 1961. So I wrote to the CIA and said, uh, is there any connection between the OSS Jim Bond and the CIA? 
and they replied back, uh, basically, uh, we can neither confirm nor deny having such records. So uh, I guess the jury is still out whether Jim Bond was a spy or not. Uh, after World War II, Jim Bond got married and uh, married the same year that Ian Fleming got married. Uh, Ian Fleming, however, was in Jamaica and he was writing a book, uh, Casino Royale, and he needed, uh, needed a name for a secret agent. And uh, that, by the way, is Goldeneye on the north coast of uh, J Jamaica. And it was a funny little bungalow then. And now it is a uh, luxurious resort and it costs about $6,000 a night to stay in the Ian Fleming cabana. So Fleming is sitting down at this desk here. This is at GoldenEye, and he's trying to come up with a name for a secret agent. And I'm going to let Ian Fleming himself explain what happened next. Mr. Fleming, how does an author tackle the problem of selecting a name for the hero of his stories? Well, it's not really the hero. I mean, I still pick up names just driving through the countryside, uh, through villages and so on. You see an interesting name. Uh, over a tobacconist or a chemist or something of that sort in any country in the world. But uh, when I started to write these books in 1952, I wanted to find um, a name which wouldn't have any of the sort of romantic uh, overtones like Peregrine Carruthers or whatever it might be. I wanted a really flat, quiet name. And one of my Bibles out here is uh, James Bond's Birds of the West Indies, which is a very famous uh, ornithological book indeed. And I thought, well, about uh, James Bond, now that's a pretty quiet name. And so I simply stole it and used it. So he stole it, but he never told Jim Bond that he had taken it. And as it turned out, uh, it took about a decade for 007 to really reach the shores of America. And when uh, John Kennedy became president, uh, Life Magazine did a big feature article about what John Kennedy reads. And one of those books was From Russia With Love by Ian Fleming. And that started the ball rolling. Uh, more and more people got interested in James Bond. Uh, Dr. No came out and uh, Mary Bond and uh, Jim Bond started getting calls late at night from breathless females going, excuse me, can I speak to James? And Bond and his wife were scratching their heads, what is this about? And finally, a friend said he read an, an interview with Ian Fleming in Rogue Magazine, in which uh, Fleming said uh, that he had stolen the name for his secret agent from an American ornithologist. So the, uh, the cat was out of the bag and uh, Mary Bond wrote to Ian Fleming, accusing him of stealing his, uh, stealing her husband's identity. And Fleming wrote back and said, yes, you've caught me. And uh, if you're ever in Jamaica, please stop by and see me. So in 1964, uh, about six months before Ian Fleming died, Jim Bond and his wife dropped by unexpectedly at GoldenEye. This is a picture that Mary Bond took of Jim and Ian Fleming. Uh, Fleming first, when he saw who it was, got very nervous and about the first thing he said was, you're not here to sue me, are you? And Jim Bond said, no, not at all. I don't even like your books, so don't worry about it. And when Ian Fleming heard that, uh, he became very relaxed. The two got along famously. Uh, the Bond spent the day with the Flemings, and at the end of the day, uh, Ian Fleming uh, took out a copy of his new book, You Only Live Twice, and signed it to the real James Bond from the thief of his identity, Ian Fleming, February 5th, 1964, a great day. So after that day, uh, Goldfinger came out and the world went crazy for 007. Uh, you know, 
the man from Uncle Maxwell Smart, uh, Matt, Matt Helm. There were so many imitations going on. Wherever you looked, it was 007, 007. There was women's underwear with 007 uh, insignias on it, uh, vodka, men's suits, James Bond mania was everywhere. And it was really getting on the real James Bond's nerve after a while. I think it really hit home after Goldfinger came out and Bond discovered a rare curlew that was thought to be extinct. And tragically, uh, he found it, a hunter found it in uh, Barbados, put it in a freezer for Bond to look at the next time Bond was down there. Bond got there, saw the Eskimo curlew and said, this bird is supposed to be extinct. And he reported on it and it was big news. And typically this would be in the Scientific American or uh, Smithsonian or one of the ornithological publications, but because of the 007 craze, uh, I found articles about Jim Bond and the Eskimo curlew all over the country. Dozens of articles, of course, the headline, headline writers had a field day. New Bond thriller, case of the curlew. This James Bond catches birds instead of villains and on and on. And here is a famous ornithologist has written this wonderful landmark book. And all of a sudden he is getting uh, shaking that stirred jokes and Bond, James Bond, womanizing guns, you name it. Uh, he got very tired of it. Uh, it got even worse after Bond died. Uh, he died in 1989 and in 2002, Die Another Day came out. And that's a picture of Pierce Brosnan from the movie walking into a Havana hotel, carrying a copy of Birds of the West Indies. And if you saw the movie, uh, you'll recall that uh, Pierce Brosnan meets Halle Berry. Uh, he is ogling her through a pair of binoculars uh, from the bar of the hotel. He's actually smoking a cigar while he's looking through the binoculars. Uh, she uh, sashays up to him and says, uh, why are you here? And he says, ornithologist, I'm just here for the birds. And of course, millions of uh, moviegoers saw this and made that connection between the real James Bond and 007. And that is a shame because Bond deserves to be more than the footnote in the 007 story. Uh, when I did my book, I researched a lot of what uh, Bond did and his accomplishments are many. Uh, he collected some amazing eggs and critters for science. Those are harpy eagle eggs that Bond collected on his first trip with the Academy of Natural Sciences to Brazil. Uh, he also formulated Bond's line. Uh, the common thought before Bond was the birds in the West Indies were from South America. And in his research, he insisted they were from North America instead and drew the line just north of Trinidad and Tobago. And uh, turns out that Bond was correct. And maybe Joe Wonderly can talk a little about that. Uh, because of his book, Bond popularized the birds of the West Indies for generations of travelers, and probably many of you in the audience. Uh, that is the red-billed streamer tail of Jamaica, uh, the bee hummingbird in Cuba, uh, the trogans and the other hummingbirds, the toadies. It's, it's amazing how many people got to see these birds because of birds of the West Indies. Uh, I showed you the picture of Bond's shotgun earlier, but I don't let that fool you. Uh, one thing he was criticized is he didn't, didn't shoot enough bird skins when he was down there. Uh, he didn't want to shoot any more than he believed necessary, but he didn't really get enough birds for a sampling uh, for science. And these bird skins are like time capsules and uh, you can glean so much information about the birds and uh, the ecology of the location uh, just by studying these bird skins today. And we learn more and more every year through these bird skins. So they were quite, quite major. Uh, so Bond in his first introduction to birds of the West Indies, uh, he was very farsighted about uh, 
what needed to be done environmentally in the West Indies. And it becomes more and more obvious because the bird populations are plummeting and we have global warming. And so in 1936, Bond is writing about the impact of clearing forests for plantations, the wholesale killing of birds by local hunters, the trafficking of endangered parrots, which goes on to this day. And he also advocated the creation of bird sanctuaries where no hunting of any kind is permitted. So I thought that was uh, pretty farsighted by him. He wrote that uh, there can be no doubt that the principal factor in the, that has resulted in the extinction or rarity of so many West Indian birds is man. He wrote that in the first introduction to Birds of the West Indies. Uh, he later in 1947 on the back of the Birds of the West Indies edition, he put an ivory billed woodpecker. And I can't imagine anyone today uh, putting out a field guide with a bird that was virtually extinct when the book came out. It, I think it was eventually declared extinct a few decades later. Uh, so the final legacy of James Bond is uh, for us tonight, he brought us all here to celebrate the West Indies and beautiful birds. So uh, I'd like you to check out my blog, therealjamesbond.net. And I mention this because I have instructions if you want to buy a signed copy of my book, uh, you can read it on the blog. And I am going to give all the proceeds from the sales of those books to uh, Birds Caribbean uh, in honor of the real James Bond because he loved the Caribbean and it just seemed like the right thing to do. So I'm going to introduce uh, Joe Wonderly now and uh, I'm going to read his uh, description of his uh, of all his uh, amazing things. Uh, he is of Birds Caribbean and he's the Emeritus Research Wildlife Biologist for the International Institute of Tropical Forestry, USDA, USDA Forest Service. He's lived in the Caribbean for about 37 years, six years in Grenada and the remainder in Puerto Rico. So Joe, uh, you're on board. Can you tell us a little about this picture and a little about yourself and then I will stop sharing the screen and we'll have a little conversation. Okay, well, thank you for the introduction. And this is a photograph uh, taken in the Bahamas, actually in Eleuther, Bahamas. And it was a project uh, we were involved in to study the Kirtland's warbler, which uh, many of you in the audience uh, may be familiar with. It's an endangered species, uh, now listed as threatened. Uh, and it overwinters in the Bahamas, and I was involved with a project there with a, uh, another biologist, uh, then from the Nature Conservancy, and uh, uh, we were doing two things. One is studying the bird, and you can see that I'm holding uh, a Kirtland's warbler uh, there, and uh, I'm surrounded by uh, to my media sites, two Bahamian student interns, uh, we were training uh, and then a field assistant to the side. And, and our goal in this was, of course, to do the science, but also to build conservation capacity in the Bahamas. Uh, and fortunately, our student interns were all very successful. They uh, were able to go off to school in the States, uh, get their bachelor's degrees. Some actually got their master's degrees uh, and returned to the Bahamas and are now working in conservation. So a lot of our focus uh, in the Caribbean is not only just on doing the research, doing the science, but also building the local capacity uh, to um, bring about conservation for uh, the birds of the Caribbean. So that's been our, our focus. Great. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here and uh, let's uh, just talk a while. Uh, Tonight, I talked about those three bird skins that Jim Bond collected for the American Museum. And I wonder if you could tell about their status today. The Bahama nuthatch is pretty much gone. Well, you know, I, it, it's easy, relatively easy to establish that it still exists by producing a live bird. Uh, but it's, it, it's hard to declare something's extinct. Uh, you may not have found it. Uh, certainly we're concerned. Uh, their populations were low before uh, the area where they uh, 
Greed in the Bahamas was hit by Hurricane uh, Dorian, which uh, many of you may remember was a class five uh, hurricane when it hit Abaco and Grand Bahama. Uh, the destruction was uh, considerable uh, to the pine forest there, which the bird requires. So uh, we're not real, uh, uh, real optimistic, but one of the things we found with these hurricanes in the Caribbean is remarkable resilience. And a lot of these populations have come back. So I'm hopeful that it still exists, but uh, there's reason for concern. That'd be great if it's still around. Uh, so <laughs> when I first talked to you, you mentioned that you knew the real James Bond. Could you uh, talk a little about that? Yeah, I. Um, the way I met him was, uh, I was a grad student and I was looking for a project. Uh, I had been working uh, on a field project in Central America. And I got very interested in interactions between hummingbirds and other nectivorous birds, such as the bananaquit. Uh, and I asked around about good field sites and people said, well, look, you ought to go to the Caribbean, but before you go to the Caribbean, you should talk with James Bond. Uh, and so, uh, the curator of the Academy of Natural Sciences uh, Ornithology Department, Frank Gill, who was a friend, said, look, I'll set up a meeting with you. And so he set up a meeting uh, with James Bond, who took me out uh, for lunch. And uh, we had a conversation about birds of the Caribbean and where I ought to work. I gave him uh, a sense of what I wanted to do. And he listened politely, asked some questions. And then he said, well, well do you know that I... Uh, in the islands of St. Vincent and Grenada, and a few other islands uh, off Venezuela, uh, that there's a black banana. He said, we don't know anything about it. So why don't you go down there? He said, you can do your studies with the hummingbirds and banana quits down there, but, but let us know what's going on with this black banana. So that's really what he did. I don't know if you've got a photo there of the two birds, uh, but. Yeah, I think it may be a little tricky at this point. Okay. Uh, but so you went to Grenada, and how did that work out in terms of uh, spying? Well, uh, in the early years, it was rather straightforward. Uh, this was before the, the revolution, and um, I actually met the prime minister. Uh, he had a party for uh, all the Americans who were on the island, and he invited us to the government house uh, July 4th. And uh, so I, I met him. Uh, he, was a crook, uh, and I, I knew a lot about what was going on in uh, Grenada. I left the island. Uh, I finished my work up uh, about, goodness, 1979, 78, something like that. Uh, Grenada had a, uh, a coup, if you wish. Uh, they overthrew uh, the prime minister, and Morris Bishop was established as the uh, prime minister. They received aid from the Cubans. Uh, I returned to Grenada back in 1981 after the revolution, and I went back to my field sites uh, to continue my work and expand on what I was doing. Uh, but I was rather naive about the risks involved uh, because it turned out there was a lot of military around, uh, and um, I, people started looking at me in a strange way. Now, most of the locals, uh, that part of the island knew me. They knew me as Birdman. And, uh, you know, they figured, well, he's quite strange, but he's harmless. Uh, and that was fine. But it uh, turns out, as I was out in the field one morning, uh, a young man started to sneak up on me. Uh, he wasn't very good at it, but he had a gun. Uh, as I remember, I think it was an AK-47. Um, and, of course, I, when I saw him, I realized that um, this might not be pleasant. So I calmly turned to him and recognized him and put my hands up. And uh, he came up, pointed his uh, gun at me. And I pulled out uh, my permission from the Department of Agriculture to do the research I was doing. Um, and I thought everything was fine. Well, he had a lot of trouble deciding which way you turn the paper to read it. So that was not a good sign. Uh, this is a young teenager. 15, 16 years old. Uh, he didn't know what to do with me, but he marched me into a compound and he took me into a room uh, and uh, he called in another Grenadian who um, 
wanted to know what I was doing, was very concerned with my behavior. And uh, they disappeared. They well, they took me into another room with a group of Cubans. And in this room, there was uh, one side was a, uh, a large poster, Che Guevara uh, and Fidel Castro on the other side. And I looked at it and I thought, wow, this is like being back in the university dormitory in the 70s. Uh, and then I realized, of course, that I was on the other side of things. And I started talking with the Cubans. Now, my Spanish uh, then was horrible. My Spanish now is just terrible. Uh, but nonetheless, we were able to communicate. And we started actually talking about uh, the birds of Cuba and the Zapata swamp. And they uh, were amazed that I knew anything about it. And they asked me, said, well, how do you know these, these things? And apparently a couple of them were naturalists. I said, well, because, because of James Bond. I said, he wrote this book. And they, one of them knew of the book, James Bond. Anyway, to make a long story short, uh, they brought back the Grenadians. They required me to have an interpreter. So I was not doing this in Spanish, uh, and they eventually let me go uh, and decided that I, I was harmless. But uh, nonetheless, uh, there were a couple of hours there I was detained, and it, yes. Because they thought you were a spy, basically, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, we talked a little about the Bahama Nuthatch earlier. What's the biggest threat to birds of the Caribbean these days? Well, Habitat loss is probably the biggest uh, threat, and uh, it goes on constantly, as you might guess. Uh, there's a big push, and understandably so, for economic development. Resort development, <clears throat> excuse me, is uh, a big pressure along the coastal areas, threatening some habitats, particularly mangroves. Uh, <clears throat> so that really is the, the issue. And then, of course, there's a lack of awareness uh, in the local uh, populations. And of course, that's for Caribbeans trying to uh, improve that with outreach and training and so on. So uh, the habitat issue is still the major issue. Some islands, hunting can be a serious issue, particularly the French islands. Uh, but by and large, uh, for all of them, uh, it's habitat loss. Uh, one last question before we answer some questions from the audience. Uh, what can we do to help the birds of the Caribbean? Well, uh, I would encourage you uh, when the world goes back to being quasi-normal, uh, please come down to the Caribbean uh, and get out in the field, see some of the natural uh, sites. I check on our website, uh, Birds Caribbean. Uh, we have a birding trail. Uh, on very or birding trails, plural, on a number of islands. Uh, and if you want to see the endemic, uh, they're easy and accessible. Use local guides, uh, support the uh, ecotourism that does exist, and we're trying to encourage, encourage it and build it. We uh, have done training for guides, uh, so we would, would encourage uh, ecotourism uh, throughout, throughout those islands. So, Great. Rochelle, do you want to join us here and uh, maybe handle some questions? Hello. You need to unmute. Yes, I'm here. There I've been go. here the whole time. <laughs> I think I was looking for the Bahama nut hatch, but I've arrived. No. <laughs> I think um, I want to thank you both, Jim and Joe, for a wonderful talk and especially for ending on a conservation note. Um, and I, I hope that many of us will have the chance to see some of these birds in person, hopefully in the next year. And um, if we don't find the Bahama nuthatch, I hope we all find the ivory-billed woodpecker. That would be the other sort of good bird to find. That wouldn't be bad. Yeah, uh, we'll take it. Um, I just want to ask everyone if you have questions, please feel free to type them in now. I'll try to get to as many um, of them as I can. I think the first question, and I have to say, I, you know, we're all, our, our ears perked up um, when we thought about GoldenEye. And we've been getting a lot of questions even off the Q&A about GoldenEye. Was that a purposeful uh, title? Yes, absolutely. And it, I think it was from a, a, it was a World War II uh, top secret mission involving Gibraltar, I think is where he got it from. And of course, Goldeneye the bird 
And he also mentioned uh, Reflections in the Golden Eye by uh, the Colors, the novel. So that's where it came from. Uh, later on, when it became a resort, uh, then the E in Golden Eye got capitalized as well. But it wasn't based on the duck. It was more the uh, Gibraltar mission. Um, so another thing, uh, someone wants to know, this is a great, uh, I love the way they phrase this. What motivated Mr. Bond to study birds? What inspired him? It's a far cry from banking. <laughs> yes, I think he went into banking reluctantly, sort of forced by the family, I believe, uh, because his father was a banker. I think Ian Fleming was in uh, banking briefly as well. Uh, he loved birds. And uh, when he grew up in Willowbrook, uh, there was a lot of great bird life out there. And I went to the campus and walked around. I kind of amazed at the bluebirds and all kinds of birds I saw on the campus. I think that inspired him. Also, his father took an expedition to Brazil when Bond was 11 and uh, it gave it real cachet that his father went down there. And of course, he went on this big expedition with uh, servants and you know people carrying his luggage and stuff. And poor Jim Bond is down there on his own with a hammock and a duffel bag. Uh, oh, yeah, or, or really, are we sorry for him? I mean, sounds <laughs> great to me. Um, okay, this one I love. Uh, Dr. Wonderly, did you ever meet Sean Connery in the Bahamas? Well, that, that story uh, I, is interesting. I was a house guest uh, while working in the Bahamas, uh, working on the project there for about 15 years. And I was a house guest with uh, Commander Tony or Anthony White. Uh, and he happened to have... Uh, been in Navy intelligence for 22 years. Uh, but after intelligence work, uh, he had mastered Chinese, Korean, a uh, couple of Southeast Asian languages. Uh, anyway, he got into birds and he was the expert uh, in the Bahamas. And so he took me out for dinner uh, one night with another uh, visitor. And they asked me, well, how did I meet James Bond? And I told them the story you heard earlier, having uh, lunch with James Bond. And of course, they knew who he was and they were impressed. And as I finished the story up, uh, a gentleman walked in, an older gentleman came in the door, went up to my host and hugged him. He said, Tony, it's great to see you. It's so good to see you. And Tony said, well, uh, uh, yes, let me introduce these folks. And they introduced me to Sean Connery. And of course, I was, I, I, I didn't really know what to say other than, well, hello, nice to meet you. I didn't really want to say, well, you're not the real James Bond. But uh, the thought crossed my mind. But nonetheless, I did meet him. I, we exchanged pleasantries. And, and that was it. Did I recognize him? No, I did not. Uh, not at the age he, this was maybe, you know, he passed away uh, recently, but uh, this was probably eight, 10 years ago uh, when I met him. Uh, I, I think also you probably would be the only person on earth who would ever say to him, you are not the real James Bond, because I think that most of the world identifies him as James Bond. Yes. Um, this is another one that's for you, Dr. Wonderly. Um, what about the status of other disappearing birds in the West Indies? The, the Zapata rail, Cuban kite, and the Semplers warbler. What's the current status of Hartman Estate in Granada? Well, let's start with Hartman Estate. I was just reading a uh, paper on the development of a hotel there that they're clearing out the mangroves. Uh, and uh, um, reviewing it, a paper submitted to our journal, uh, the Uplands are preserved to protect their uh, endemic uh, dove, the Grenada dove, uh, but we're obviously very worried about this mangrove uh, damage, although it's not necessarily going to affect the dove, but nonetheless, uh, it will affect the various water birds. Uh, so that's a concern. The Zapata rail, uh, we don't know a lot about it. Uh, there was a European, I uh, believe, Dutch ornithologist who had searched for it, thought he had found one, but there have been no other recent records. So uh, concerned about that. And the Semper's warbler, uh, no recent records either. So uh, discouraging. 
Yeah. Uh, but there are other, you know, populations that have come through who that have gone through population bottlenecks after hurricanes, for example, uh, in the Bahamas, uh, the recent hurricane, recent hurricanes, plural, uh, have knocked back a woodpecker population there, uh, the tropical or the West Indian woodpecker population down into the hundreds, yet they still manage to keep bouncing back. So uh, there, there's some encouraging signs. Some of these populations have real resilience if they still have the habitat. If the habitat gets smaller and smaller, well, we're going to lose them. Which is why we need more ecotourism. So it's really full circle. So um, this one is back to you, Jim. And a lot of birders visit the various parts of the Caribbean to go birding. And someone wants to know, do you have any information on Bond's visits to Tobago or Little Tobago? Ooh, uh, I'd look up uh, one of Mary Bond's memoirs about that would be my guess. Uh, if they email me, I'll try to look up, look it up for them. Yeah, and both the, um, we've, we've had requests for both of your um, contact information and your website and URLs, and we will try to make that available to on our website um, so people can reach out to that you. Would, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. um, so another question is, did Bond have any formal science training before embarking on collecting trips in his second career? That is a really good question. I, I don't think he did. I think he must have hung out at the Academy of Natural Sciences, but I have no record of him really studying birds. I know he went to the St. Paul's School uh, up in uh, New Hampshire, and he was under the guidance of a really good birder up there, and he may have learned a little, but I don't think he got any formal training in that regard. Well, I guess there's hope for all of us then is yes. the answer. Um, this is sort of uh, probably back to Dr. Wonderly, but either of you, and this is, I love this question. It's about the intersection of, you know, human wildlife conflict. And someone wants to know, can agriculture and bird life coexist? I'm thinking of Dominica where two endemic parrots are protected. However, smaller Hako parrot has become a problem for farmers uh, because it eats crops and things like that. Um, <laughs> it's it it, of course, is a complex problem. Uh, and in the case of Dominica, there uh, has been uh, some good studies that have been done actually by a, a Jamaican scientist, ornithologist. Uh, he's actually now in New York. Uh, and he has done some very good work with local farmers uh, in trying to find ways to reduce the depredation on the citrus crops uh, there uh, by the parrots. And uh, he has some ideas. Uh, I can send you his name at uh, some time. You might want to have him give a talk. So uh, the other uh, side of the coin is uh, shade coffee. Many of you uh, have heard uh, that plantations of, of coffee that have uh, a shade overstory can actually serve as good habitat for birds. Uh, and I've worked on that in, in Cuba, Jamaica, uh, Dominican Republic. Uh, and indeed, these working shade coffee plantations uh, do have the potential to provide habitat if they've got a good overstory. That is, it uh, sort of mimics the, uh, the structure of the native forest. Uh, so there are certain types of agriculture that certainly can uh, exist. Uh, we're working with goat farmers in the Bahamas uh, to try and benefit uh, the Kirtland's warbler because goats uh, should be Kirtland's warblers like goats, uh, or at least like goat farms. And so we're trying to uh, come up with a cooperative arrangement there. So it is possible. It's not easy. Um, yeah, and I don't know if you, both of you know, but there was uh, a very exciting event a few years ago, a Kirtland's warbler graced Central Park, and it was a life bird for many, many people. Um, <laughs> So uh, another, this is more back to you, Jim, uh, just about your methodology and putting together a book like this. And someone wants to know all the research behind the book, well, they, they're stating, it's very impressive. And they wanted to know this, because in this age of wanderlust, obviously, how many countries did you visit in order to research the book? Uh, the answer is not enough. <laughs> uh, I went to Jamaica twice and Gold and I uh, did a, a great trip to Cuba with the Caribbean Conservation Trust and uh, saw the bee hummingbird and the Cuban toady and the trogan. Uh, so that was great. I've been to the Bahamas uh, with the Nature Conservancy and 
I did a lot of uh, trips to Philadelphia and Maine where uh, Jim Bond spent his summers and actually wrote a book called uh, The Bur Birds of Mount Desert Island. Um, I'm going to also, I'm just going to read this comment. It's not a question, but I think it's so amazing. Someone just wrote us, I actually have a signed copy of the first 1947 edition of Bond's West Indian Field Guide. As I remember, it was signed at the Linnaean meeting after his lecture. And <laughs> And I corresponded with him about my observations um, on Nassau in 1964. So I love that someone was there for that li that Linnaean lecture and is here with us now. So whoever that awesome. Called, that's the best. You're you're anonymous, and that is that's amazing. Um, and I'm actually going to ask this question because I, I had been to St. Lucia a few years ago and did not see this species, but. Um, are there any recent records of the um, St. Lucia black finch? Do either of you know? I believe, yeah. I believe there are. Uh, if you ask me who, I can't tell you, but uh, the bird can be found. It's up in the rainforest, it takes a little work. Uh, probably having a good guide uh, is, is the way to, to find it these days. Yeah, I think the picture that I used for that black finch was taken for Birds Caribbean fairly recently. So, and it was a great photograph too. And there are some recent pictures, I believe, in eBird. Uh, yeah, and I'll ask one more that's uh, more of a sort of systematics question. Uh, either of you take it, but um, someone wants to know if uh, the house wrens on each of the Caribbean islands should be upgraded to their own species. I think I'll give that to Joe. <laughs> <laughs> I. I, I, I pass it to my colleagues at the American Museum. Uh, <laughs> I, think, I think it's like, we'll just say, call Paul Sweet. That's really uh, that's You know, there's certainly differences between them. The songs are different and so on. The whole question comes down to, well, well you know, how, how do you split them? Because they, uh, you can't use the, the classic uh, biological species definition because the two species, because they're on separate islands, never meet. So you don't know if they're reproductively isolated. Uh, so um, I'm not, I'm not going to make a call on it. Well, Paul, Paul answered. Paul, he heard the call. Uh, Paul says split them. So we have, we have an answer <laughs> from the audience, a pretty educated answer. So Okay, that's great. Uh, but I'm not going there. <laughs> thank you, Paul. <laughs> yeah, thank Thanks. you, Paul. Um, and then I'm just going to leave it with um, one of a uh, last question. This one goes to you, Jim. And it's um, was Ian Fleming interested in birds before after meeting James Bond? Uh, certainly before. Uh, he was a big bird watcher. Uh, and if you read some of the 007 novels, you will see they have a lot of bird references and. Uh, I don't want to say any more because it would be a spoiler alert, but when he wrote uh, For Your Eyes Only, the first 400 words of the short story are a description of the red-billed streamer tail, and it's beautiful. So this is before he knew the real James Bond. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, and I think with that, we're going to conclude the Q&A, and I want to thank you both for being wonderful speakers and um, really uh, helping facilitate an engaging Q&A. So thank you both. And I'm going to pass it back to our president, Ken. Thank you. And thank you. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for a, a wonderful presentation tonight. Um, Jim, your research was uh, so impressive and your story was so engaging. And I thank you and uh, uh, Dr. Joseph Wonderly both for the uh, important conservation message that you both carry. So I hope that all of our members uh, will be present for next month's annual meeting and that everyone who had the opportunity to be with us tonight will return for our next regular speaker meeting in April when we will feature the documentary film Full Circle about the nesting terns on Great Gull Island. Following that film will be a talk by the executive producer and via McCullough. So until then, uh, good winter birding everyone. Stay healthy, stay active, stay warm and stay positive and have a very, very wonderful February. Joe and Jim, thanks again. Thank you, good night. Good night all. <laughs>